stage. We heard about this next project. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on around. We'll do it all in one continuous movement. Um, so we heard about Critical Minded from Elizabeth Mendez Berry at, um, when we were together at Sundance and immediately thought, wow, that's something we need to bring to this conference, to, to this discussion, uh, a really important part of how we balance not just the support for the representation, but also the way that that is then reflected in cultural uh, reporting and cultural coverage. So um, uh, we reached out to Eddie Torres, our colleagues at Grantmakers in the Arts, um, to help continue this discussion as well. And Salama Shah Tillet is with us uh, for uh, to add the critical perspective. And it takes a village, so we're all helping each other with mics, etc. Eddie, take it away. Um, we have the uh, the slide advancer. There we go. Fantastic. The clicker. Okay. Elizabeth, I'm going to ask you and Salamisha to get us started. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks to everybody for being here all the way in almost the end of the day. Um, thank you so much to Media Impact Funders for Vince and, and Fiona and Roshni and the whole team for hosting us. And thanks especially to Salamisha and Eddie for joining me up here. These are longtime co-conspirators and so grateful that, that we could all be here together. Um, so I'm going to get started by providing a little bit of context for what this work is, and then Salamisha is going to dive in and talk a little bit about what she does as a cultural critic of color, as a feminist critical superstar, supernova, and then um, Eddie is going to guide a conversation among the three of us about what, this, what it all means. All right? Um, so the first thing I wanted to do is just say something about what what we're talking about when we talk about cultural criticism. And I have to say that the last presentation from Donna and Elizabeth invited, you know, would have been a very rich to engage with as, as a critic when you think about national mythologies and aesthetics and the role that music plays in emotionality and all of that stuff. So we're not gonna do that on this panel, but it would have been <laughs> great too. Um, so cultural criticism is any form of analysis or evaluation of culture. Right? It can be specific to a particular artistic discipline, like theater or dance, or more broad. And it can come in many forms. So it can be podcasts. Like, the, Has anybody heard of uh, Still Processing? Still Processing? Beautiful podcast uh, from Wesley Morris and Jenna Wortham at the New York Times. Another great uh, criticism podcast is Art Movements from Hyperallergic. Um, but then there's also tweet storms of people freaking out about scandal. There's, and then there's also the more traditional forms, which we also will talk about the review and the essay. So Critical Minded is an initiative co-founded by the Nathan Cummings Foundation, where I work, and the Ford Foundation that aims to support cultural critics of color and to amplify the value of cultural criticism, not just for arts ecosystems, but also for a democracy more broadly. And I think to the word that Donna just used, the antenna, the idea of having the capacity to think critically about the culture that you consume is very much what we're interested in and, and what makes for an engaged, uh, engaged audiences and engaged citizenry. So I want to put on the table my biases, because I know this is a group of critical thinkers, and many of you are journalism funders. Are any of you arts journalism funders? Hands in the air? Woo! Yay, thank you, thank you. I would love, I know some of you, and I also would love to talk to the others of you, because I'm, I'm, I'm super excited also to be able to share this in this forum, um, to learn from you all and what you're learning in your work uh, as, as funders. And so, I got my start, I'm a recovering music critic, so I have a very strong bias. Got my start at Vibe Magazine, um, and then I was, I'm also a former journalist. I covered criti uh, criminal justice, I covered uh, politics, and in philanthropy, I've been a journalism funder at the Ford Foundation and also an arts funder at CERTNA, and now I'm the hybrid that you see before you today, which is the director of the Voice, Creativity, and Culture Program at the Nathan Cummings Foundation, which supports arts, media, net neutrality. It's a, it's a free, kind of freedom of speech and freedom of imagination kind of um, body of work. And so one of the things that I observed as a writer was that sometimes the conversations in the culture pages were more honest, productive, and passionate on the issues that also appeared in the political space in, the, in, the, in a newspaper or another publication. Um, and there was this tendency 
in the cultural context to, to be more comfortable with nuance and to be more comfortable with um, holding multiple positions simultaneously, whereas in the political context, a lot of times what would happen would be much shriller and aggressive. And so I was really curious about that, and I think um, I, one of the, the quotes that always stays with me is from Jeff Chang, which says, politics is where some of the people are some of the time, and culture is where all of the people are all of the time. Unfortunately, we have a crisis, and this is actually to borrow language from Salamisha from a conversation we had the other day, we don't just have a crisis of representation in culture, we also have a crisis of interpretation. Right now, um, most of the most influent, you all can read this if you want to, and there's also a, a little handout at the back. For example, in film criticism, 27 white male critics for every one woman of color critic. Those numbers have real implications for how films get treated, who gets supported, who gets resources. So that's why we started Critical Minded. Um, and we also you know, are experiencing a, a political context that we think is really important to have people who have both an aesthetic and political analysis to respond to. And so um, you know, we have a reality TV president right now, right? We have white nationalists who, um, you may have heard, uh, disrupted a book reading at Politics and Prose Bookstore in, um, in DC the other week, if folks heard, heard about that story. They actually performed uh, elements of a Woody Guthrie song, This Land is Our Land, but they, uh, yeah, it, your land, my land, but they stuck on the Our Land focus, right? The aesthetics of that, I think, are really worth interrogating, but unfortunately, due to our current landscape of cultural criticism, there are very few people who have the opportunity to do that. So um, this is another example of where we stand politically. This is a piece by Jim Denomi, um, who's a Native American artist in Minnesota, who did this piece about Standing Rock. Um, it was actually funded by the State Arts Commission, and Sun Sun, I think we talked about this recently at the GIA meeting, he was actually a, a Republican lawmaker went after him and critiqued the fact that he had received state funds in order to produce some, you know, this, this piece, which is very critical of Trump, obviously. And then a group of trolls went after Jim, the artist, and people actually went to his home and attacked him, and attacked his, attacked his land. So I think what, what we're feeling is as if uh, critics can play a really important role as first responders, helping us as a, as a society understand what's happening um, and what the stakes are and what the relationship between our mythologies and the aesthetics of our communities are and our belief systems and how we can actually disrupt those. Um, so I can get into the, the details of what the critical-minded um, program looks like, but maybe we maybe first I'll pass over to Salamisha, okay. and you can talk a little bit about um, the work that you're up to. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, honored to be here. Um, I'll just do a quick bio, like Elizabeth did. Um, and I fell in love with literature as a child, and when I got to college, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, and I realized that I could like study literature for the rest of my life. <laughs> it changed my life. I wanted to be a lawyer, and then I ended up becoming a professor. So I got my PhD um, in American Studies, and then came back to Philadelphia. My first job was at Penn. I was, I was saying to Elizabeth, I commuted back and forth between Newark and Philadelphia for 10 years, and now I'm at Rutgers. Um, uh, and, and so part of, you know, I was trained as a formal critic in the academy, um, and I decided that years ago that I wanted to do a project on Nina Simone, and I would always say I wanted people to read it. So then I kind of reinvented myself as a more of a journalist um, and so I do have a kind of hybrid um, of cultural criticism, trained in some ways through the academy, but also um, reportage and um, opinion pieces. So uh, in the spirit of reinvention, I um, am part of critical minded through a different variety of ways. Um, but one of the things I wanted to say about this quote here is like, you know, when you think about cultural criticism, I think everyone goes back to the your English class in high school and your teacher making you see something beyond what you were reading, right? Like what's happening in this text or what's happening in this book? And for a lot of students, including my partner who's an engineer, that was just a very challenging kind of, you know, he was interested in the books, but then like what's beyond the written word? Like what does that mean? It's this other space of imagination 
and interrogation. Um, but for someone like me, it was like really exciting. Um, but uh, I thought this was a really interesting article um, and a good quote about the way in which we think about cultural criticism, right? Cultural criticism isn't simply your English teacher telling you to read beyond what you see, but also it's a way of um, helping us understand who we are. And so that's kind of what was happening to us in, in class that day, but it's also happening to us when we read cultural criticism. Um, and so uh, I think it's really fascinating. I don't know if anyone watched the Game of Thrones finale, but everyone's a cultural critic right now. <laughs> and I didn't know, 14 million people signed a petition and really what they were critiquing, and I'm one of the, I didn't sign the petition, but I'm one of the critics of it, um, was that like, you know, storytelling plot, that's a failure for these characters to live up to what we thought they were supposed to be. That's actually like cultural criticism in real time. And so what I think Critical Minded is asking and, and demanding is what if we apply some of those techniques to other questions outside of Game of Thrones, which does include politics and gender and race, but we actually amplify that um, to a larger degree. So here's just a quick piece. Alexandra Bell did this really interesting, de she's an artist who did a really interesting and um, uh, important deconstruction of New York Times uh, coverage. Um, and she has a new piece now in the Central Park uh, Five that's at the Whitney. But this is just like, to me, what cultural criticism kind of looks like if a visual artist was trying to teach us and show us what cultural criticism. And, she, and she's a trained journalist, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I just wanted to show two pieces that I wrote, um, one in the past and one recently. So there was a huge controversy around this movie called Birth of a Nation related to the filmmaker, um, Nate Parker, and whether or not he had sexually assaulted someone in um, college. And so for me, there's that controversy, but then like, you know, what are the ways in which we can think about the text differently? Like versus me critique Nate Parker himself, but how does the piece itself maybe Think, uh, think through these uh, complexities and, and um, contradictions, and is it present there? And so I wrote this piece on uh, Birth of a Nation, and um, part of it meant that I had to go back to the transcripts of um, Nat Turner's trial, as well as look at the novel that came out in the 1970s, as well as look at the movie. And so you see this kind of history repeating itself in which sexual violence is used in particular ways. So this is an example of the way in which kind of my interest politically, I didn't want my um, assumption of his guilt or innocence to then become the conversation, but I wanted, that, that was shaping how I read the story itself. And so this is one way cultural criticism, I think, can work. Um, and then I wanted to give, uh, we added these slides late, so this is another piece that I wrote that uh, came out in the Times on Sunday. And this is like me as a cultural critic who also is an organizer, but I take those skills of cultural criticism and think through how does politics exist in our society, right? So for me, it wasn't that different to see a pattern in a text, um, isn't so different for me to see a pattern in political organizing. And so sometimes I think cultural criticism is seen as light and opinion pieces are seen as hard uh, or political journalism is seen as extremely hard and important. And I wanted to give an example of the way in which the way in which we interpret society, the way that we can read how certain bodies exist and certain ideas exist are equally important. And then that's basically, I just want to, I'll do two slides. I'm not gonna say anything about this more than the cost of not having critics engaging in these issues would be the Green Book winning uh, the Academy Award. Wesley Morris wrote a beautiful piece in the Times and I think he really wanted to stop that train from happening, but he was unsuccessful. And, and we talked about this as well with like this, you know, that uh, Rotten Tomatoes functions as an aggregate of cultural criticism and that shapes how viewers and audiences read. And this is another piece that came out, um, the controversy with the biennial a couple of years ago um, about Emmett Till. So I won't spend too much time about that, but that it took a while for the conversation about how do you racial appropriation and art to kind of hit the mainstream, even though the activists had caught on quite quickly. So, and one thing I would just add that just made me think about um, Stuart Hall and, and the notion of, in, in political discourse, there's, you know, one side, another side. There's some, uh, there's certainly subtext, but there is a little bit of clarity about what people are, are talking about, and that's what people are reporting on, right? And in culture, a lot of times it's about that revelation or that unveiling and recognizing what the, what the currents are beneath, what lies beneath the most obvious interpretation of what's going on. 
Um, and so it's been really interesting to sort of explore that through Critical Minded and to look at, you know, a case like the Green Book example. Well, and the macro, I would just say, and, and, and then I'll, sh I'll shut up, but is that we are in a time when, um, you know, white nationalism, white supremacy have increasing power within the halls of, of, of power in this nation, right? And we're at a time when the interpreters of our culture are vast majority white men. The level of blind spot, parallel blind spots that we're exposed to, even as I think the majority of the critics will be liberal, right? from a political standpoint, but in terms of their analysis and, and recognition of these other currents and dynamics and their literacy in a whole body of aesthetics and, and perspectives is much less present. And so I think one of the animating questions for us within Critical Minded is how can we make, how can we intervene in order to have, in order to move um, our cultural conversation so that it becomes as generative as it can be of the, you know, kind of the democracy and the, and the collective imagination that we're dreaming of. So related to that, I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about um, critical minded in terms of what it does. And there's one specific example I'd love for you to be able to talk about, which is the infiltrators at Sundance. Um, I don't want to limit it to that, but I do want to make sure that you do, that you do talk about that. I would be delighted to, thank you. Um, He's a plant. Uh, <laughs> uh, so one thing that's really important to say about Critical Minded is that it's a critic-centered initiative. So um, if you if you grab a handout on your way out on the right-hand side on the on the chair, we had six uh, founding advisory board members who you know weighed in on everything that we did, um, and we continue to to um, you know be informed by their perspectives um, from a governance perspective, from an advisory perspective, and all of those things, and just from a conversational perspective. Perspective. So that's kind of the, the ethos of, of what we're doing. And then um, we've been, basically we've been going since uh, December 2017. Both of you were at present at a, at a convening that we had that was multi-generational, multidisciplinary. The youngest critic who was there was maybe 23 years old and the eldest was probably 75. Um, and it was, it was an incredible conversation. And from that, we gleaned some of the challenges that people were contending with and also the opportunities that they saw. And we've been building our strategy around that. So so one of the big questions was, how do we, we can't get, we can't get on the list for Sundance. We can't get on the list for the Whitney Biennial. We can't get on the list. We're not, we're not getting accreditation or we can't afford to travel to attend these big events. And that was a big obstacle because then it meant that they weren't contenders for certain types of freelance opportunities and things like that. So what Eddie was referring to is that we um, invested in something called the Press Inclusion Initiative at Sundance where we, we, along with several other funders, I don't know if any are in the room, but if you are, please put your hands in the air. I don't think, so. okay. Um, but yes, and MacArthur is one of them as well, um, Open Society Foundations as well. And, um, what happened was those 50 critics attended. Most of them had never been to Sundance before, um, and they produced a, a ton of writing. They went to see a lot of movies. They wrote about movies that would never have been written about otherwise. The staff at Sundance said, oh my, you know, this, this short film from Sierra Leone got you know, a feature about it, right? Which was something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and the, the one example that I wanted to mention, which, which Eddie mentioned, is The Infiltrators is a film. It was one of very, very few Latino films, U.S. Latino produ Latinx produced films in the show, in the, in the festival. And the night that it premiered, there were at least five that I knew that I could count Latinx critics in that audience, one of whom was undocumented. And the film is a docu, sort of docudrama, docu-comedy about a group of undocumented young people who infiltrate a detention center in Florida. It's a really interesting and I think uh, provocative film. And, you know, that was more Latino film critics in one room than there are on staff at, any, at, at all publications around the country, I feel pretty confident in saying. Um, so they were all part of 
setting the discourse around that film and ensuring that it was um, that it had the complexity and nuance uh, that we aim for. So, just quickly, we also fund POC-led outlets that do journal uh, that do uh, cultural criticism. We've um, supported research on to understand the demographics of criticism and how this shapes analysis and advocacy around that, and as well as cross general gather uh, generational gatherings to build community. Now, um, you, you've touched upon something that I'd like you to talk about a little bit more, which is we're at a cultural moment now where we're seeing increased diversity on stages, on museum walls, on screens in movie theaters. Um, but, you know, certainly from the perspective of grant makers in the arts, and, and uh, I know no small number of other people who feel this way, that diversity is what they call in management basic hygiene, you know, the, the least you should expect in a given situation. Um, and that diversity is not justice. And so you made reference to, to Salamisha's quote that um, we have a crisis not so much just of representation, but of interpretation. And when you look at that through the lens of diversity as being something separate from justice, can you talk about that, particularly in this moment with the biennial going on, et cetera? You wanna take this one? Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, just thinking about the question itself and why, what I meant by crisis of interpretation. Um, so this semester I had the opportunity to teach an MFA class in cultural criticism and the students either identify as fiction writers or poets, so it was kind of a brand new experience for all of us and we're trying to define what cultural criticism is. And I really kept on, you know, we kept on going through the process of this is the art of interpretation. We are giving um, an audience or a reader a way of looking at something that they wouldn't have had access to or the opportunity to if I didn't write this piece or if you mm. didn't write this piece. And so then that this is the reason why you need more voices actually, right? Like it's on the, outside of the fact that there's an increase of um, people of color producing art and their art being um, actually seen and appreciated and for the first time in probably American history. Um, but also, you know, so there's that, like there's a increase of numbers. So the, the critics shouldn't in fact re reflect the artist, but there's also where, missing the opportunity to have really rigorous, robust, um, and exciting and passionate dialogues around culture. And for me, why that's such a crisis is because culture is both the indicator of where politics is gonna go, right? So politics legislatively, judicially, lags, you know, it's far behind where culture is going. So if you really are thinking about the front line, if you really are trying to imagine either where we would like to be in terms of idealistically, or the, what potentially could, a kind of dystopic thing that could be on the horizon. It is through the culture wars, it's through the artists, and through the cultural critics. So I feel like, you know, I'm always just saying, if we're really committed to these questions of justice and freedom, as we just saw in that documentary, and um, then that, then who are, how are we empowering those who can tell those stories to us um, and really show us how to get there um, with as many resources and opportunities as possible. So sometimes I think the critic is not seen as an artist, but I feel like it, the critic is an artist. If you really read good cultural criticism, your world will be changed. And so mm -hmm. that's, I'm just gonna make, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm verklempt. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> okay. No, I, and I would, could I say, could I add something please, to please. that? So I was gonna say, I think that, um, you know, it's, I totally agree with everything that Salamisha said, and then I also think about local culture mm -hmm. and local cultural criticism, right? There's always gonna be a million think pieces, good, bad, or indifferent about Beyonce, right? But the question of what happened, that example that we shared in Minnesota or what happened in Washington, D.C., these are the, the culture wars are actually made up of skirmishes. You know, most of what happens happens in these kind of um, smaller scale, uh, moments of friction, and if nobody's there to pay attention when that happens, then we have a real, pr and not only pay attention when, when it happens, and, but also understand it. And I would just also quickly, the, the Green Book, and I, I would also offer the Roma example. A lot of people love the film Roma, and I love the film Roma, but I actually learned subsequently, thanks to some indigenous critics who have a very different perspective on that film and found it to be extremely problematic in terms of the inertness, or, uh, and basically what they argue is that 
you're conflating representation and agency, mm -hmm. right? She doesn't have agency. She is on screen, but that doesn't mean she has power. And so I think when you when you speak to the question of uh, diversity versus power, when within critical minded from a strategic perspective, we're thinking about who are the editors, who are making the decisions in these newsrooms, and how can we transform that? Because as long as we keep the conversation here, we're not really understanding how the power operates in those spaces. Right. Now, I would like to take a moment to take uh, one or two questions. I see a hand in the back. If we can grab a microphone, fantastic. And then one more hand right over here. Great. Um, I love so much about uh, this program. Um, and one question that I have is, uh, as a funding institution, we are not able to, or we haven't yet, funded individual critics. And as, uh, even as an individual, I'm really curious about how would I support um, individual critics. I know some people that I read have Patreon accounts that I sometimes give money to. Yeah. But I'm, I'm interested both at an institutional level and at an individual level. That is, that is a fantastic question. Thank you. Um, I'll say it's a challenge. Um, there are There is the arts writing program that Andy Warhol has been sponsoring for many years is one mechanism that supports specific critics. What we've done thus far, it's something that we're wrestling with. What we've done thus far is we've supported individuals um, around sort of, you know, that question of accreditation, travel, community building, um, professional development, and things like that. We haven't thus far supported people to do an individual act of criticism, um, but it's on our minds. However, what we've heard, and this is a conversation that I think we've had, is that investing in editors can also be really seismic, and there hasn't been as much investment in editors, so our, our support for hyperallergic funds an editor. Uh, our support for arts.black also funds an editor, and each of those editors are then working with you know, 20, 30, 40 writers um, and having a, a transformational impact on their practice. So that's where we are now, but I'm happy to talk to you more about it, right? Yeah. And I think there was one more question, and then we should wrap up. Thank you. Hi there. So before going into foundation work myself, I have worked in the cultural critic space. One thing I'd like to ask you about is how social media impacts the importance of critics. A lot of times I see mainstream publications going to like black Twitter or whatever they think is ethnic social media to kind of mine people's ideas and obviously they're getting these ideas for free. How does that impact the investment or focus on supporting cultural critics that are you know in, within the mainstream and beyond? How are you? I mean, this is a real question, so do you have a... Yeah, I get, well, you go, f uh, do you want to, well, I guess what I'll say is that we're, so in our thinking about Critical Minded, we're, we're trying to, as I mentioned, you know, there's podcasting, there's, there's different ways, and the example that Salamisha shared also of Alexander Smith's work, right? Critical practice d is not limited to traditional essay formats, and I think that there is something really exciting and, and urgent that's happening and democratizing that's happening online, and at the same time, I want to acknowledge that several of the critics in our networks, we have critics in our networks you know, who have hundreds of thousands of followers. And, um, and in fact, a lot of their critical practice actually happens through Twitter. And they also get viciously trolled and they get death threats and they have serious security uh, challenges that they contend with, uh, which always speaks to me about the fact that, you know, folks um, who are against freedom of expression or people who are against these ideas are very clear about their power. Um, so we're looking at it um, in the sense of recognizing its importance and trying to figure out a way of, of, of just not ignoring it. And I think we're also critical of it. We're critical of the platforms for the degree to which they exploit the content that people produce for free. So that's another part of the body of work that the foundation where I work does. Um, and we're saying people actually need to make a living and that's a core platform, of, a core, core tenet of what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, I think that was a really good response. We're wrapping up right now, so I would just say that um, that was another example, though, of the way in which cultural trends that happen in one space then get picked up in more mainstream or more conservative spaces. Um, so it's just, again, the idea that some, the vanguard um, criticism will always be, not always, because Critical Mind is trying to change the dynamic, but will often be happening in, it, it gets to maybe the times last, I wouldn't say my work per se, but it gets, you know, it gets to these mainstream publications later than others. So 
how do we speed up that process? And critical minded is one to metabolize, way to yeah. speed that process up. Yeah. And so just by way of wrapping up, I just want to make the point that I, you know, I think you've probably already made better than I could, but um, I've got the mic. Um, <laughs> You know, which is that when we look at the news, when we look at uh, uh, journalism, our perspectives, our opinions, our worldview has already been formed by culture, so much so that we're probably unaware of it unless we are able to deconstruct the narratives we've inherited, and that is the role of the cultural critic, and uh, that's why this work is really essential. So thank you very much for doing it. Elizabeth Salamisha, thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah.